Microphone check. Okay, I got that works. Still sitting up here. Gonna start. Hopefully I'll be done by six with all the setup stuff. Come on, USB. All right. And this up. This goes like that. On. Oh, there we go. It's alive. Perfect. Uh, okay. Everything's set up. I think. Six o'clock, which is in two minutes. Oh my God, I'm so hungry. I gotta eat something real quick. Be right back.
All right. I think we can get started here. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the stream, and uh, my name's George. Uh, let me hold on. Let me get chat open here. Stalling for time. Okay. Um, so yes, welcome to the stream. And I just got home from work, so I'm a little brain dazzled here, but we can, it's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. We can get started here. Today we're going to be doing compiler construction which is actually kind of one of my favorite things to do. I only got into it later because I didn't get a computer science degree. And I started reading like, I took Coursera classes and started reading books on compiler construction. It's a really interesting topic. There are a lot of really cool things that go into it. And um, I kind of think of it as like the purest computer science because it's all about managing complexity. Compilers can get extremely complex and in the, process of managing that complexity and building a compiler, you tie together everything, like everything that computer science has to offer, it all comes together in compiler structure. construction, you build, you'd solve a lot of interesting problems as you're building the compiler. So it's really fun. Um, I kind of fell in love with it later after the fact, it's maybe my second programming love other than video games, like, <laughs> if video games didn't exist, I, I possibly would have become a compiler author instead of a video game uh, programmer. Um, so I mentioned complexity before. Where is it? Where's my book? Oh, it's right here. This right here is, let me, let me get OBS up here so I can make sure I'm framing this well. This is the main, this is the main, maybe not the main, but this is a, a well-known book about how to um, build compilers. And you can see it has a dragon on the front, right? Uh, maybe you can't see that very well because this thing is small. Make bigger. <laughs> you see the dragon, you see the dragon. The dragon represents complexity complexity you can see up here the complexity of compiler design it's a very complex topic and uh, all of these things that <laughs> it's kind of a cheesy picture but all of these things that the knight has are the tools that uh, compiler construction people use to to deal with that complexity so lexers and parsers syntax directed translation data flow analysis, like a lot of tools have been developed over time to deal with all these complexity and break this huge task down into smaller parts. Uh, so put this back over here, make this guy smaller again. This is weird. How big was it before? I don't even know. So the, you know, those are the two, I'm gonna go over like, uh, you know, large view, like what are those tools? Uh, what what does each tool do? Okay, start from the very beginning. We're gonna build a programming language. Say we're gonna build a programming language. We have to start from square one. We literally, we have a bunch of source code in a string, you know? Like we read in a file that has source code on it and you have a string that has the code, all right? You have to figure out how to execute the code in that string. That's the central problem of, uh, of writing a compiler. And that, that's like, that's such a big problem. There are so many problems we have to solve, but we're gonna break it down one by one. Uh, okay, so step one is you have code. It looks like, you know, what does code look like? It looks like here's some code. It looks like all this junk. Step one is to take this and tokenize it, okay? That is, walk through the string and look at each token and separate it out. So instead of a list of, instead of a list of characters, instead of a long list of characters, 
you have a long list of tokens. All right. So you run your code through this tokenizer and you get a long list of tokens. So let's say we have a, we have code that looks like this. If um, a dot uh, b equals 12 uh, curly bracket return true. I don't know. All right. We run, this is our example code that I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna run through our little imaginary compiler here. We start with this. If a dot b is equivalent to 12, curly bracket return true. After we run it through the tokenizer, it's going to look like this. It's going to have, let's see, how do I wanna do this? I'm gonna use, a, I'm just gonna use a, an array. It's kind of a fake syntax that looks vaguely like C++. An array of tokens, um, and that will be called token stream. All right. So in this example right here, we're going to have an array of tokens, an if token, uh, an open parenthesis token, an a token, a dot token, a b token an equivalent token, a 12 token, right? A, a close paren. Notice that all the white space is removed. In some languages, the white space is important, but we're gonna assume that we're not in one of those languages. We're just in a regular old boring white space removed language. That's the tokenizer's job to remove all the white space in the file, remove all the comments, and just have a list of all of the tokens in the program, okay? To finish my example, return true semicolon and close curly bracket. All right. So this is step two right here. Step two. Good. Uh, so like th th there's a little bit of subtlety here, which is possibly too early to get into, but uh, like this guy, not all of these tokens are made equal. This guy is an if statement. So let's maybe try and use some different colors. This guy is an if statement. It's a keyword in the language. The compiler knows about him beforehand. Say, same thing with uh, return and true. The compiler knows about these guys ahead of time. Um, they, they mean something part of the language. Uh, same thing with this punctuation. Actually, I'll make punctuation a slightly different color. Punctuation, punctuation, punctuation. They're not keywords, but they're still like set strings that the compiler knows about beforehand. Whereas this guy, A and B, these are identifiers. These are uh, tokens that the programmer writes. Like at some point, maybe the the programmer wrote a struct and uh, you know something like this. Struct something and gave it the name A. You know, so this this is an identifier as opposed to uh, like a language keyword, but the tokenizer doesn't care. Like the tokenizer, the tokenizer will identify a keyword versus an identifier, um, but then it will just give a huge like it will make note. Okay, this was a keyword. I know about this guy. This is a punctuation. I know about this guy. But then it will just say this is an identifier. I don't know why. I don't know what it means. All I know is that it's an identifier. Identifier identifier all right it will mark this one as punctuation 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 and it will mark these uh three right here as keyword 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 all right so i i hope you'll agree that a huge list of tokens is much easier to parse than uh than like a just a string of characters, okay? Um, and when I say parse, parsing, you know, people people will sometimes throw the term parsing around um, like you're trying to parse uh, some data or something. But in the context of compiler construction, the word parse 
has a very specific meaning. And it means taking a stream of tokens and building an abstract syntax tree. So we'll see how that works, okay. So here's our stream of token. We're gonna run it through our parser. It's the parser's job to get this stream of tokens and change it into an abstract syntax tree, okay? And the tree looks like this. Uh, let's see, you have like, uh, you have a class that's a node of some kind, okay? And it has some child nodes, part of it. You have, you have some kind of list of child nodes. Children. All right, so you have some kind of tree then. Uh, here's the root node. And then let's say this is an object-oriented class so that just under the root node, the root node is like your entire program, say. And then just under that, you have you have a class. And you have a class. You have all the classes in your program. This is, it's called an abstract syntax tree because it's a, it's a tree that represents all of the things in your program. This class has an, an identifier, which is the name. And then it has a, like a, maybe some, some, I guess they're called methods, not functions when they're part of classes. Method, method, and maybe some uh, fields, field, okay. And then same with this class, has a name, method, field, okay? And then a method, an individual method, will have an identifier that is its name, right? You, so you see how we're building all of the parts of our program. It might have some arguments. And then it will just have a series, of, like, a, like a list of statements. Statements. Okay, so the, you know, the first statement of the method, the second statement of the method, finally the return statement at the end. Um, so we're building this tree that contains every part of the program. Every, like every statement is a node in this tree, every expression is a node in this tree. Absolutely everything is contained in this one gigantic tree. It's the abstract syntax tree. Okay, so I guess... I guess I drew these arrows wrong. This becomes this, okay? This list of terms gets turned by the parser into an abstract syntax tree that looks like something like this. Um, and the specifics of how it does that, I'm not gonna, we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. How it turns a stream of uh, tokens into a tree, it's really interesting. It's called recursive descent. Uh, well, that's just one method of doing it. But you can already see that it's easier, it's easier to get this syntax tree from this list. I hope that's evident. It's easier to get a syntax tree from a list than it is to get um, the syntax tree directly from the characters, right? So we've separated the tasks here. It's the tokenizers. Uh, you know, this tokenizer actually has a better name. It's often called a lexer. Um, so I should call it a lexer instead of a tokenizer. It's the lexer's job to create this stream of tokens and it's the parser's job to take that stream of tokens and turn it into a tree. And those two are separate things. And because they're separate things, that reduces the complexity of the whole thing because you're, you're like, like you're isolating the complexity into smaller pockets that inter interact with each other. Compiler construction would just not be possible if you didn't have these methods of reducing complexity like this. Okay, so you have another step over here, which is uh, like uh, type checking. And, uh, and like rule checking for the language. So type checking means if you have a, if you have a, something that looks like this, int k equals, um, and then I give it the string, uh, you know, abc. That's a type error because this guy right here, 
This guy right here is of the type string. And this guy right here is of the type integer. You can't assign a string to an integer, we'll say in this language. There are some languages where you can, like JavaScript or whatever. Um, and that, so that might be desirable this, for you. You would not throw an error in this situation. And then there are other languages like C++ where this would, you know, if you try and do this sort of thing, the compiler is just going to say, what the hell are you doing? You can do that. Um, so if you want any type checking in your language, this is the point at which to do it. You can read this tree and there's a, a node somewhere in the tree that represents this statement. And then you crawl that node and you say, okay, what's on the right side of the, of the assignment and what's on the left side of the assignment. And you evaluate both types and you make sure that both types are the same, or at least that they can be, one can be converted to the other. Okay. Um, and then there's rule checking. So for example, if I do this, if I do this and K equals 12, then this is perfectly fine. This, this type checks fine, but uh, it's outside the rule of the language. That rule is that I cannot have two variables of the same name in the same scope. So I have to enforce that rule. And this is the stage at which I enforce that rule. So at the end of this stage, I, I, I have evaluated all the types of all of the, all, all of the expressions in my, um, in my abstract syntax tree. But I haven't really, other than that, I haven't really changed the tree. It's still basically the same tree now with type information. Uh, but I've validated, if there are no errors, we can continue. I've validated that the abstract syntax tree is, is a correct program that can be compiled. Okay, so uh, so we have a nice abstract syntax tree. Now there are two places that we can go with it. Actually, no, is there really only one place? I think there's really only one place we can go with it. Yeah, yeah, and that's to um, code, code generation. to an intermediary language. Intermediate, uh, intermediate language. Language. Okay, so at this point we have our abstract, abstract syntax tree and we're going to crawl it. We're gonna iterate through the tree. And whenever we hit a function, we're gonna start generating a assembler, well, like assembler, uh, something that looks assembler that corresponds to the contents of that function. Okay, so for example, if I have something like int k equals 12, and then int j equals k times, put an asterisk, k times two, then at this point, I guess I've lost the example that, uh, hi, we're just learning what a, what the, like, what the larger, pieces of a compiler are because I'm, uh, I'm working on a project that involves a compiler. And we'll see that in a bit. Um, so if these are two statements that I have in my, in my source language, then I need to have, you know, I need to convert this to some kind of um, assembler like, you know, list of instructions. So it might look like this, move, um, and then you have to have some kind of code that picks a register. So we're just gonna arbitrarily pick register eight and we're gonna move the value 12 into that register. So we move the value 12 into register eight and that corresponds to this assignment up here. And then uh, we have to do a multiplication k times two. So we're gonna have a multiply instruction and we're gonna pick another arbitrary register R9, okay, to be the target of uh, R8 and two. So this instruction will multiply R8 times two and put it in R9. So that corresponds to this instruction, this, this statement, okay? So the, the, the job of code generation is to crawl the abstract syntax tree and look at all of these statements that are represented in a tree structure. Here I've written the source code, but they'll actually be represented in some kind of tree structure. It'll be like assign 
uh, K on the left and 12 on the right. And then there'll be another assign. And there'll be a J on the left. And on the right is uh, like the, mul the result of the multiplication of t K and two. All right, and this is my this is my function right here. It contains these two statements. So this tree right here, this tree right here, this whole tree is what is going to be run through our code generator to produce these two assembler instructions. Okay. Now, generally, what compilers do when they generate assembler is they use something called single static assignment. Single static assignment. And single static assignment looks basically like, like an assembler, uh, like an assembly, um, like an assembly language thing, except that it has a, a special rule that any register can only be assigned to exactly one time. Exactly one time. Registers are immutable, and you can only assign to uh, a register once in a single function. But you have as many registers as you want. So that's why it's called single static assignment. It's not the actual target language that you're trying to generate, like uh, x64 ISA or ARM ISA or something like that. But because it's in this single static assignment form, it's very easy to reason about the language because we have to do um, we have to do manipulations on this on the on the um, assembler before we can convert it to the actual. And you'll see we're going to be doing a lot of manipulations of this assembly language, this assembly like language, and it helps to have it in this single static assignment form. So this this is a valid single static assignment form right here because I assign R8, so the value of 12 gets moved into R8, and then the value of R8 times two gets moved into R9, and, I, and then I never assign R8 or R9 again. Um, so this is, this is a legitimate single static assignment right here. If I had put R8 again here, then that would not be single static assignment. So that's an example. Okay. So we have our code in single static assignment. Now we're going to run an optimizer on it. Or optionally. We can optionally run an optimizer on it. If we're running in debug mode, so if our compiler is running in debug mode because the programmer wants to debug their application, that would not be a good, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to run an optimizer in that case because an optimizer is going to obfuscate the program. Uh, but so, op but an optimizer can do a lot of good stuff. You know, if you're running in in, in an optimized mode, you want to get the absolute fastest performance that you can out of your um, out of your program, and you're running in an optimized mode. Then there's a lot of good stuff that you can do. Okay, so for example, let's say we have move uh, r1 the value of two. I'm going to use this arrow notation, even though. Uh, yeah, I'm going to use this error notation. In fact, I'm not even going to move the move instructions because I, I hope this makes sense. So we're moving the value of 2 into R1, okay? And now we're moving the value of, uh, let's not do that, 3, 2 times 4 into R2. And then we're going to move the value of uh, R1 plus 8 into R3, okay? And then we're gonna return the value of R3 as the, uh, as the result of this method that we're, that we're writing, okay? So there's an optimization that can be done here. In fact, there are a few. There are a few optimizations that can be done here. And the compiler will try to do them if it's, if it's running in, uh, in, a, in like an optimization mode. Uh, so for one, you can see that R3 is the eventual return value of this function. So R3 is, is used, right? It, we know that the result of R3 is gonna get used because we return it out of this function for the clients of this function to use. So that means that R1 here, 
So R3 is going to get used. That means R1 is going to get used. So R1 is going to get used. So this value 2 is going to get used. But notice that R2, R2 is not going to get used. Never is R2 actually referenced. So the programmer wrote a line of code that doesn't actually get used in the end product. And this happens all the time. Um, and so we can do something called dead code removal. Dead code removal. Okay, we've established that this code is dead. Nothing references it. And so we can remove it from the application entirely. So now we're going to have a new program that looks like this. R1 gets assigned the value of R2. R3 gets assigned the value of R1 plus 8. And now we've made our program a little bit faster. All right, so this is the optimization step. We made our program a little bit faster by, uh, by removing some dead code that wasn't used. Okay. So now we're going to do, so we saved, so we saved a third of our code, right? Now we're going to do something called uh, constant propagation or constant folding, constant folding, constant propagation as some name like that. We're going to notice that R1 here always has the value of two constant number. R1 can only ever be the value of two. So anywhere ahead of this point in the program where R1 is used, you can just erase it. You can just write two instead. Right? Should be legal. R1 can never be anything but two. So we haven't changed the actual program. Isn't that right? Like the, the program does the same exact thing, uh, except now it runs two plus eight instead of R3. Uh, so we haven't really done anything yet, have we? Except that, um, like the program will still take the same number of steps. It has to calculate R1 and then calculate R3 and then return R3. Except we can do dead code removal again and we can get rid of this assignment to R1. And now, uh, now R1 is not in the program. So we removed another instruction from the program, right? This is, this is the sorts of things that, that optimizers do to make your program faster. Um, now it can see that this two plus eight is always like, this is a constant two plus a constant eight. So we can just get rid of this and say 10. And then it can do constant folding again and replace all instances farther down in the program of R3 with 10. So we're just gonna get rid of this and say 10 instead. So we've optimized this entire function to just a single instruction. You know, we can do dead code removal again, remove the assignment to R3. So now our, our, you know, our function used to be four statements, one, two, three, and then the return. And now it's just one statement, it just returns. So that's the sort of thing an optimizer does. And uh, you can see why, I think you see why the, the optimizer really likes things to be in single static assignment because now it makes it easy to search the rest of the function for, okay, anytime R3 is, is, uh, is referenced, R3 becomes 10. We know that nobody else ever wrote into R3. So R3, everywhere below that in the program has to have this same value of, of 10, this optimized value of 10, okay? So that's the optimizer. So you run your code through, oops, through an optimizer and you're still gonna get single static assignment, but it'll be now optimized. So now the one last step, nope, there are still two more steps. There are two more, we're on the third to last step, okay. Um, let's see, what was the name of this next step? I, you know, it's still basically code generation, but of a different type. Okay, this time we're generating an actual ISA. So the input of this is the single static assignment that we've optimized, and we're gonna do code generation, but change the single static assignment from change the single static assignment into, now it's actually gonna be the actual ISA of the system that, of the platform that we're targeting. So if we're compiling something for Intel x64 Windows, then we're gonna do this code generation 
to write out the actual byte code, like the actual, not just, not just instructions, but all of the bits that, you know, this program is required to have for particular, for a particular function. We do this at the function level. So at the end of this, we have a function that has a bunch of instructions in it that represents that function. And then another function that has a bunch of instructions in it. But these are now Intel ISA instructions, okay? Or, or ARM ISA instructions or whatever your architecture is. Uh, and then the last step, the very last step, is the linker. The linker step. Okay? And the job of the linker is to take, like, you've now compiled a bunch of methods or functions. You have function f, function g, all of the other functions of your program. And each function has a bunch of assembler in it. Uh, and the last step is to take all of this, all of these assemblies and shove them together into one binary. My program dot exe. And that sounds like it's easy. Just take all of the, uh, you know, assembly bytes and just concatenate them together until you have a program. But it's actually, it's actually not. It's actually a little bit involved because of jumps, because of points in the program where you have to jump from one place to another. And if you're, if you're like, if you do it wrong, then when you concatenate all of these things together, like, you know, okay. So for example, if in, in if in function, ugh, if in function F, I, I call function G, how does the, how does the assembly instruction know that I'm currently in function F and I have to get to function G? How does it know that? Right? It doesn't until you put all of these things together in the program and then you have the exact address of function G that you can jump to. I mean, you take this sort of thing for granted when you're just programming because the compiler does it for you. But when you're just looking at instructions, you have like a jump instruction, jump, okay. And you have to give it like a number here, an address of, of the G function. You want to jump to G, but you have to give it like an, an address of where G is in the memory. The, the program doesn't know that. It's going to be like, you know, one A, F, G, two, E or whatever, right? You have to give it the address of the code, you know, this address right here, the start of the code of the G function. Um, but you can't calculate that until you have all of your methods concatenated in your executable. So you put all your methods together, you decide where they're, you decide how they're going to be organized. And there might be some optimization there too, because you could say, okay, these two methods are used together. So we're going to put them together so that they're hot in the cache or something like that. Anyway, you decide on that order. And then you have to go back through each method and say, oh, okay, well, this jump corresponds to that function and that function is here. So I'm going to modify that jump so that it points to this function. Like you have to do another pass in order to make sure all the jumps are correct. Uh, and this is actually kind of the, it, it, it feels to me like the hackiest part of, of writing a program because it's literally like you can't just, you can't just write the code the first time as you're doing this code generation step. You can't just write it correct the first time. You have to go back and do another pass and correct all of the things that you didn't know, which feels weird to me. Um, but that's how it's done. And then finally, you have your myprogram.exe, and you can double click it and run it, and your, you know, whatever awesome program you're making runs. Um, so. So that is a very high level overview of all the different steps that a compiler takes. Um, and the reason I'm doing this stream on compiler and construction is like I mentioned before, it's really like a, a lot of interesting problems get solved in the process of making a compiler. And I have found that although I rarely ever have to write, well, except for today, today we're writing an actual language. It's the first time I've ever needed to write a full language from scratch. Oh, I missed a step here. I'll get to that in a moment. 
It's the first time I've ever had to write a full language from scratch, but most of the time you don't actually need all of the steps. But it can be useful to know some of the individual steps. Reason one is that you know what your compiler is doing, so you can write better for your compiler. Right? If you can know if you know how your compiler works, your compiler is like a little machine. And if you know the properties of this machine, then you can write better code for that for that machine. You can write more efficient code or smaller code or whatever. Like you have you can have your compiler generate the thing you want it to do if you understand what it's doing. And uh, reason number two is that some of the individual parts of compiler construction are useful in other places. And I'll give you an example. I've used, um, like, especially the parsing and lexing part, okay? If you want to make a data format, like a data format that you, you dump all your data into this format and you don't like JSON for some reason, I don't know, maybe for some crazy reason you're writing a, let's say for some crazy reason you're writing a, like a JSON reader, right? That, uh, that takes JSON or XML or, or some data format and reads them into your program, and you aren't, you know, maybe you're writing in a new language that doesn't have a JSON reader or an XML reader, or maybe you're dissatisfied with any of the existing ones, you want to write a better one, or maybe you um, are dissatisfied with JSON and XML and you want to write a more compact um, format, or for, uh, for whatever reason you want to have a data format, you can write the parser and lexer for it yourself. You don't, it doesn't, you know, you don't need a full programming language to write a parser and a lecture. Parsers and lectures are, are useful for um, really any kind of textual format, right? So the, problem, the, the, the solutions to problems that we learn as we're learning about compiler construction are useful in other places, even if you never actually write a compiler. And the one step that I forgot about, which I'll just fill in right here, uh, is... The interpreter. So the interpreter. So um, in the case of C and C++, the processor does this for you. It takes the the code that you've generated, the uh, the assembly code that you've generated, and it runs it through the processor or the computer. But that's actually the uncommon case. Most programming languages have another program called an interpreter that runs over that combines you, the ex the instructions of your program with some kind of input either user input or some files or something or other some kind of input to your program and it generates the output of the program okay for C and C++, this is the processor of your machine. It does this for you. But for many languages, Java, uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, Python, they have another program that reads your program and writes out the, the result. So, interpreter, good. Um, so those, that is, that is compiler construction in very broad terms. And I'm going to get specific now and we're going to go and, uh, make some progress in writing one, not this. This is the other thing I was doing. Uh, okay. Hold on. I got to get set up for that now. Here it is. So I'm going to explain what the project is. If any of you are familiar with my math videos. Oh, wow. That looks weird. Well, uh, okay, I'm going to get rid of this for now. If any of you are familiar with my math videos, you will know that I like teaching math. Um, and last November, actually almost a year ago, a year, a year and a half a month ago or something, I gave a talk at um, a JavaScript conference where I made this little JavaScript app which describes how vectors work. And it was elucidating for me because I realized like this is a better version of my math videos. You know, imagine me actually talking about what's going on here. 
using vectors to describe what Mario is doing here, okay? So what I want to do is I want to start again with the math, math videos, start again from scratch, but use this interactive format, okay? And I'll, and I'll show you, and I'll show you more concrete terms what I mean by that. Okay, so this is kind of this is kind of half of what I want to see. Oh my, what the? Something messed up here. This is this is half of what I want to see, where there's like an interactive section. Excuse me, of the website. Oh great, yeah. Uh, <laughs> perfect, yeah. Um, if you like math then look down below and there's a link to my YouTube channel where I have a bunch of videos about all the math that's um, that you need to do video game development that's basically what I did before I started streaming and now I seem to have broken I seem to have broken the page what is going on let me get the actual one. You gonna load? Are you gonna load? We often do math on this stream actually as well. Um, last week we did bear matrices, which are used in like rendering to do dithering and that sort of thing. So that'd be a good one you can check out. So let's try this again. All right. Great. Perfect. So, oh, nice. Okay, so then, um, so I want to do something like this talk, except, and also like my math videos, except combine them together, make interactive math videos where like over here, uh, you know, there, so there's a math lesson going on over here on the left, okay? And then there's a code pane on the right. And you type like this, you type vec3a, something like that, okay? And then when you do that, poof, a vector, a vector appears on the right, you know? And then you type, again, you type vec3b. And then, poof, another vector appears on the left, right? And, the, and so it's showing you on the left what you're doing in the code. And then you type vec3 uh, a, c equals a plus b. And then it'll go poof. And it'll add the two vectors together. And then th it'll mark this vector c, right? And then if you play with the vector over here, then it will update the code. It will be like, oh... So you put the vector at the coordinate one three, so it's gonna be like one three. And then you put this vector, this vector right here, you put it at uh, one negative two. And so it's gonna update the code. It's gonna say one negative two, right? And I hope that makes sense. This is what I want. So that, so that, so you update it over here and it appears on the left and you update it on the left and it appears on the right. Um, and the two things are interacting and this, the, the goal of this is to be like, a, a, a mechanism for understanding, um, for, for teaching how vectors work interactively. Uh, looks like you liked my quaternion videos. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Those were one of the more difficult videos to make and I'm still not sure that I did a very good job with them. And that's actually part of what I want to fix here is I want to do a better job with explaining a lot of the things that I did. And it will be interactive so people will hopefully understand it better. And I'm also planning to go into geometric algebra, which I never did in my in my other videos. So, which is a much better way of, um, well, I don't know about better. It's a different and, and often revealing way of thinking about linear algebra is geometric algebra. Um, same topic, but just a different way of viewing it that can be like more globally, um, what's the word? I don't know. Anyway, geometric algebra, it's a crazy subject. So we won't go into that. So the, so the goal here is to have the language on the right and the vectors on the left 
and then they interact with each other. So in order to do that, um, I pretty much need to write a programming language because it like it needs to do. So for one, I need to be able to like interrogate the language to see what it's doing. I need to be able to get at the insides of the language in order to um, see what it's doing over, you know, see what the programmer intended over here on the right so that I can reflect that on the left. And then I need to be able to uh, get to, you know, when, some, when something happens over here, when the programmer does something, you know, the user does something over here on the left, I need to be able to reflect that back out into what's happening over here on the right. Okay. And all of this needs to happen in JavaScript. So if it weren't for that, I might just say, oh, well, LLVM has some great, like, um, you know, LLVM has some great language parsing utilities and I can just use their their part, their part code generator and write my own parser or something like that. I don't know, like, LLVM is basically made for you to write other languages with. Uh, it's really great for that. But it's in JavaScript. I don't think LLVM has, I'm, I'm not actually looked, but I don't believe that LLVM has any JavaScript bindings. That would kind of be crazy. Um, it has to be in JavaScript because it has to run in a web server. So I'm pretty much, I think I'm pretty much reduced to writing my own language. Uh, and anyway, if I do that, I'll have really tight integration on this web page. So writing my own language is the name of the game. No two ways around that in order to do what I want. I'm, I would be really happy if someone came in and said, oh, hey, I know this JavaScript software that will do exactly what you want to do, uh, but I haven't found it yet. So that is the name of the game. We're going to write a compiler so that we can write this interactive math teaching website thing, uh, which will be the next, which will eventually become the next iteration of um, of my math for game developers videos. Okay, so let's see. That took 50 minutes to explain all that. Great. Um, so what should be the next step here? So, okay, so the, the website that I'm making that will do all this interactive stuff is called Scalar. So that's what I have open here, Scalar. Um, and I've already gotten a head start. And what I think I'm going to do is explain, uh, and Scalang is the, is the language, Scalar is just a placeholder name, you know, and Scalang is the, is the name of the language that I'm writing to do this interactive stuff. So I have to like write this language from the, pretty much from the ground up here. Um, and so I'm just going to, I'm just going to real quick go over, let me set this back to two columns and oh my god I didn't remember where I had everything okay I'm pretty much gonna I'm just gonna go over like all of this stuff that I've done so far so that we're all like on the same page uh, yep yeah, that should do it nope this one too and this one. Oh wait these two are the same yes Close that one. So I'm gonna run over like what, what I've done so far, make sure everybody gets on the same page, and then we'll start going into our parser um, and uh, like adding some features to it. Because I haven't really gotten far in this language yet. Like th this, wait, here, where's my, this compiles. It doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't actually return 12 yet. It just passes my parser. <laughs> and then I do the most modicum of type checking and then that's it. Like I haven't done any um, code generation or optimization. I may not do any optimization at all uh, if I don't need to. So no code generation or optimization or, or, or interpreting has happened yet. Just a lot of the uh, uh, parser has been, the, the lecture and parser has been written and I generate an abstract syntax tree, um, also called an AST. Uh, and that's it. So we're going to go through each step here and see what is there. So, okay. So let's start in this function right here. I'm sorry, this file, parse.js. Okay. So parse.js has both lexing and parsing. And I think actually type checking, I just put a bunch of stuff in the same file. Yeah. So it has a bunch of different parts in this in the same file 
All right, we have a program object that stores the AST, the abstract syntax tree, um, a map of all of the types that like uh, exist in the program for use in type checking. Uh, and um, we'll get into more detail about all of these later as I go through the program. And then a list of messages like the error messages of the program. Okay, we have a method for compiling. It should be pretty unsurprising given what we just learned. It, uh, it creates a new program. It runs the, it creates a parser and a lecture. Um, oh my goodness, did I do this right? I think I didn't. Yeah, I think I need to say new right here. New lecture, new parser. Jo I don't really understand JavaScript all that well. I'm not a JavaScript person, but since I want this thing to run on the web, it means that I'm kind of forced to write in JavaScript. So there are a lot of things about JavaScript that I honestly don't understand. And this is one of them. Like it will let me use, I think, I think the difference between having new and not having new is that it will let me use a global object versus creating a global object using this object as a prototype. But I'm not entirely sure what prototypes are yet either. We'll learn that. It's JavaScript. We'll learn, we'll learn some JavaScript as we go. Um, I've definitely been frustrated by a lot of the lack of, of, of safety in JavaScript, and I'll probably be frustrated a lot about that in the stream as we go, so we'll see. Okay, so we create a parser and we create a lecture, and then we run... Uh, okay, we pass our lecture into the parser so that the parser knows about the lecture. And then I run the parser, and I give it the AST that, you know, this is the AST that I want back. And then uh, if it didn't parse, if it had an error, then I'll just return the program, you know, an incomplete program. Uh, otherwise, I'd go on to static type checking. I'll probably need something like this as well. Don't proceed if type checking had an error. All right. Let me come over here real quick and... Uh, make sure that I'm not start. I'm pretty sure I didn't have any like other changes that I'm going to be writing over top of. So let me make sure of that. And no, these are the changes that I just made. So we're, it's clean state. This is the changes that I just made is clean state. Let's run the tests. I have it set up. So if I control B, then it runs the test. Let's see. Undefined is not an object. What does that mean? That was probably created when I passed new in here. Yeah. Undefined is not an object. Why would it say that? So parse.js line 128. Ugh, which thing is it saying is not an object? Evaluating token strings. Oh yeah. I guess these can't be new, huh? Oops. I guess that's what that means. So this token strings is... Let's see. Oh, wait. I think I know how to solve this. I think I know how to solve this. Okay, I'm going to put these news back. I read something at work today about JavaScript. If, if anybody who's a diehard JavaScript person is going to be laughing at me right now, but that's fine because I'm just learning. I'm not a JavaScript person. Okay. So I think, it, wait, I know where I can, we're going to learn something today. Here we go. Google speed thing, test, page speed. Yeah. And then let's see, reference. Uh, rules, JavaScript, there's like a, somewhere on this page, there's a JavaScript optimization, JavaScript optimization, um, let's do this, page speed, JavaScript optimization, there's like an article somewhere about this, 
minify JavaScript up to my mm -mm 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 -mm. no this is not what I want you know I think I sent it to myself in my email let me check my email over here real quick I'm not gonna check my email live on stream sorry you can see all my messages from my mother oops I want to get this page because it has the syntax that I need to use to um, to fix this bug. So here we go. Oops. Developers.google.com slash speed slash articles slash optimizing JavaScript. Google couldn't find it, but that's fine because I emailed it to myself. So I think this is the um, syntax that I want. So let's try that. Dot prototype dot, wait, no. Lexer. This all needs to come over here. That will work? Yeah, that'll probably work. Eh, you know what? Let's not do this now. Let's not do this now because I'm gonna I wanna get through this program. So we'll just remove the news for now. Make sure the test case is passed. Good. Okay. So that's the function that compiles our program. Good. Um, so now let's move on to the lecture. This, this is a list of all of the possible, this is my hacky way of doing like a C++ style enum in JavaScript. Um, and it's a list of all the possible tokens that the compiler can output. So we should like, this should be familiar if you watch the first part of the video. Um, let me pull stream chat back up in case someone's trying to talk to me. Can't you test JavaScript speed with Chrome dev tools? I have no idea. Like I said, I'm not a JavaScript person. Um, you probably can. And I don't have Chrome installed, but I should do that by the time I'm done um, with this project. But I'm not gonna worry about the speed right now. What I, like, what I wanted to know was just like some guidelines of writing code that's fast in general. Uh, and so I was gonna try and modify the code to, to this to see it, because I think like this syntax will help my, with that problem that I was having, but not even worrying about that right now. We're focusing on compilers right now. So, all right. So these are all the different tokens, token types that are allowed in my language so far. Uh, this is the static declaration type. This is a semicolon. That's like an, like an arrow. Uh, you can see I have an arrow right there. So that's not pointer dereference like in C or C++. That is arrow like um, specifying the return value of a function. Open paren, close paren, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, uh, the return keyword, the int keyword, you know, the int keyword right there. So you'll notice there's a lot of stuff that's not here. There's no, um, there's no float. There's no addition, no subtraction. We haven't done any of that yet. There's no multiplication, division, none of that. There's no... Um, there's not even a dot, like there's no, like if you have a, a complex type, you can't say a dot b if a is a complex type and b is a member. You can't do this yet. We're gonna work up to that though. So these are all of the token types. Uh, these are their string representations in just a simple list. Okay, so this is a method of creating a new token. A token has inside of it the string in the source file that, um, like that, you know, so so data would be like return for the return token. It's just the string um, that represents that token. And that's necessary for identifiers, which can, which can be anything, right? So like, so main is the identifier of this method right here. And uh, so the token, um, in the token stream, the data for this identifier would say, main right in here. 
This is the type of token. It comes from that list that we just saw. Um, the line number that it's on and the character, you know, the, the, the character at which it starts and, which, and where it ends so that you can print errors. Okay. Uh, this creates the lecture object. So, oops. Oops, again, I keep knocking this thing. So a lexer, in, in our drawing over here, I lied to you a little bit. Um, because I said a lexer takes this array of characters and creates an array of, of, um, of symbols, of parsed, of, of lexed, um, tokenized symbols. And that's not entirely true because the parser uh, only wants to look at the next token and the current token. So you don't need to create all tokens at once. And so what this parser does, and a lot of parsers do it this way, is it only ever, par it only ever lexes the very next token. Okay, it keeps track of where it is in the file. And then uh, when you say, okay, what's the next token? It'll give you that. It'll calculate it on the fly and give you that and then advance to the next token. So you have two um, methods here in this lexer class. You have a peak method, which tells you what's the next token that's been, that's already been lexed. And then eat. And the eat with the eat method, you tell it what type of token you expect. And then if, that's not the right token, it will bork, it will give you an error. Um, if it is the right token, then it will return true and then it will parse the next token. I'm sorry, it will lex the next token. Okay, so you can just say like, and I do it a bunch of times, you can just say eat peak. So whatever, like whatever the next token is, I don't care. Just give it to me and I'll accept it. And that's perfectly legitimate, you do that a lot. But most of the time, a lot of the time, you only want like open curly. There's nothing that can be here. There's nothing appropriate to be in this spot except an open curly. And I'll give you an example of that uh, right here. So when you get to this point, you're parsing the stream, you get to the point where you see that integer type. Uh, there's nothing that can come after that other than an open curly, right? Like in C, you can, you can put you can put a semicolon here for a declaration, but in this language, you can't do that. You don't need declarations, so I don't have them. Um, and so you have to have a curly, a curly brace come after that. So th this is why I've set up the function this way. You have to pass it in an expected thing because usually you know exactly what's gonna come next. Okay, so then we have um, some functions for whether something is white space um, for, what is this, get basic token Oh, okay. So it will, like, it will look at the next thing in, in our in our string of characters, and decide what like what kind of you know, it will try and figure out if it's one of these guys. That's all. Get basic token. So it will return like uh, it will return the um, the token that is the longest match for what we're looking for. So like. If, if you do A less than B, then it will give you the less than token. But if you do A left shift B, then it will give you like, left shift is longer than less than. So it will give you left shift, uh, even though less than is a prefix of left shift. I hope that makes sense, but it's not that important. So let's keep, let's keep going. So this lets us know whether like a character is a number or not, whether um, it's an identifier, you know, different different types of things for for lexing t for lexing strings, whether something is an identifier, um, helper functions for peeking at the next character and calculating the next token, all of this stuff. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this stuff because. Um, yeah, like next token is the thing that actually goes through. And actually this one might be worth looking at. Let's take a look at this one. So this is the lexer. This looks at a string, a string of characters and decides what the next token is. Okay. So let's do it on this. Let's do a lexing of this string right here. Okay. First of all, we have a loop that says while our string is white space, it peeks at the next character. And if it is white space, 
then it will skip it. It will proceed to the next character without remembering. Okay? So in this case, we have a new line which is white space, and a new line which is white space, and a new line which is white space. So it'll skip all that, right? So the lecture is where it skips all of the white space. So at this point, we know all the white space is gone, so we must have a new token. So we create a new token, we assign it to next. And then we have to figure out what kind of token it is. Um, uh, we have to do a special check to see if we're at the end of the file. We might be at the end of the file, in which case we create an end of file token and then return that. Okay. Then we try to get a basic token. And a, and a basic token is like, a, you know, Curly, open curly, close curly, open paren, close paren. These, these basic ones that were up in that array. If it is a basic token, then it will, um, it will like, it will like collect all of the characters in that token into this data string and then return that. It'll return that as the next token. Otherwise, it might, maybe it's a number. If it's a number, then we collect all of, the, all of the characters in the number, and then we return that number as a token. So, for example, this number right here, 12. Otherwise, it's probably an identifier. Uh, and, like, for example, main in this case is an identifier. Or um, the syntax is going to be a little bit different from C. So I'll use a different number here. Um, it's kind of backwards of, of C. I'm declaring a variable a that will have the value 24. So a in this case is an identifier. And so it will hit this code and will say, oh, this is an identifier. Return that identifier as a token. So that's the basic idea. We're just walking through each character and saying, okay, what are our, what are our rules for the tokenizer for this language? Uh, and then we follow those rules in order to get, you know, in order to calculate what the token is. And then we return that token and then the parser takes it from there. So that's really, that's it for the lecture. So let's look at parser. Um, we have a, so, so the parser, remember, it takes a series of tokens and it generates an abstract syntax tree. So the abstract syntax tree can have nodes of any of a, you know, a bunch of types. And these are the types. So it can have like a global node you know, it's either a global function or a global um, a global variable or something like that. And uh, I think function definition is a, has, yeah. Maybe, maybe not. So yeah, function definition I think is a type of global, um, but maybe not, maybe not. Oh, you know what? Global is just the high level. Okay, so global is like the global scope. Inside of global is all of the function definitions and, and like global functions and global global um, variable definitions. A function definition may have some arguments. It has a block, like a block is, a, is, a, is enclosed by curly brackets, which has a number of statements in it. One of these statements can be a return statement. Uh, the return statement will have an expression that it returns and so that's as far as I've gotten so far. Um, obviously, we're going to need a lot more stuff. We're going to need like object that, you know, multiply. We're going to and et cetera, et cetera. We're going to need a lot more token types, not token types, uh, node types in our in our AST. Um, so here we're declaring, we're, we're defining all of the different node types. Here's a generic node type. AST node. Um, here's the global node, which will contain some objects, which will, you know, currently the, it, you'll only have function definitions, but later we'll have other stuff. We'll maybe have classes and all this stuff. Uh, uh, An arguments, arguments. Right now, I don't support any arguments, so arguments is empty. Function definition has a name and then some number of arguments and then a return type, in this case int, and then a block which contains all of the statements in that function. All uh, right, then we have a statement and a statement currently, you know, it's empty. Um, I think like statement is like a, is like a parent class that has, that will have a bunch of subclasses. I, I use air quotes because this is JavaScript. It doesn't really have classes, but like same sort of thing. Um, so one of the statement types is return statement. 
and it has, uh, let's see, uh, an expression in it. Like that's the expression that you're returning and that's it. Um, we have a block, which is just a collection of statements. So here's a block. This block has one statement in it. I'm going to add another one. A equals B. Now it has two statements in it. So for example, and the, so you have, okay, I'm going to skip over the rest. Well, there's only one more in expression. So that's all of our AST nodes. This is a constructor that creates the parser. Uh, let's see. Okay, and the so this is where, this is where the real meat of the parser is. Um, I really like working inside these parsers. Uh, each of these functions is a function that that reads the. So this is called a recursive descent parser, and it's called that because as it reads the token stream. It recurses, uh, and as it gets like as it gets farther into the program, your call stack gets deeper. Uh, that's not a very good explanation here. Let's try again. There's a function that parses a, a function like this. Where is it? Um, like this. Parse global. We'll parse a global symbol. Okay. And then that will call a function that parses the arguments. And then it will call another function that parses, uh, where, 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 parses the type of the return, you know, the return type right here. And then another function that parses the block of statements. And the block of statements has a function that parses each individual statement. And, Every time one of these functions runs, it just pulls. So you can pull. You can see it pulling tokens off of the token stream. Okay. So a block. What is a block? Well, it has to start with an open curly. Okay. And then it can optionally have any number of statements. Here we have one statement. And then it has to end with a closed curly. Right. Hopefully that makes sense. So it will eat an open curly. And then it will parse a bunch of, it will just call parse statement. It doesn't care what parse statement does. Okay. Parse statement will do its thing and it will return a statement, which it pushes onto the statements array. And then it will require a close curly. So that's what, uh, that's what park blo parse block does. Parse statement, you know, so it can be any, any type of statement. It can be a return statement, a for statement, a while statement, an if statement. Or it can just be a regular expression statement. And uh, so it will check, you know, currently I only have support for a return statement. So that's not very interesting. But a return statement must start with a return. And then it has an expression. And then it must end with a semicolon. And then it, so it builds all that up and then it returns the statement. So this is why it's a recursive descent parser because you're kind of descending through your program, recursing like, calling deeper and deeper and, and you know, this, the, func the function that um, parses a block calls parse statement and then parse statement calls parse expression and then parse expression. You can see you're building things up on the stack. And then as you go through the stack, the tree that you generate kind of represents your, your stack trace. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I think it's interesting. I think it's really cool. So there's a method here for parsing every construct of your program. This will parse globals. This will parse um, the type. So, you know, just one thing it parses right now, and that's an integer. This will parse function arguments, although, it, you know, it just requires open paren and then close paren. It doesn't actually do um, function arguments right now. This will parse blocks and so on. Okay, so um, the static type checker, I'm actually going to leave that here uh, because I actually want to start coding today. I've just been talking the whole time. I've not actually coded anything. So um, it's a lot of explaining. But now let's get to programming here. Actually, I'm going to take a quick water break because my, my voice is getting hoarse. And then we're going to start um, building some more features into this language uh, by modifying our parser. I'll be right back.
All right. So I'm trying to think of what would be a good uh, a good first like a first uh, feature that we can add here that won't be too um, complex. And we could try addition, or we could try defining variables. Um, Let's see. Actually, I think we should do functions. I think we should do functions because you can do a lot of stuff with functions. No, I think we should do operators. I'm gonna just argue with myself here a moment. Uh, maybe we could do an if statement. Yeah, if statement would be interesting. You do if statement or fuck. Okay, here are the options. If statement, operator, functions, or assignment, variable assignment. Let's just, let's just take it easy. Let's do variable assignment. Let's do that. I think, I think that's a good low bar. We'll get more complex later, don't worry. Um, but we'll do we'll do variable assignment for now. So let's see here. These are the two test cases right now. This one is an error case. Uh, let's see, error duplicate global. So the idea of this one is you know the main function is defined twice. So this test case is this test case passes if there is an error. Right, it's kind of an opposite test case. You have to test that things fails as well as that things succeed. So, um, and this does pass because all my, all my tests pass right now. So, but let's close this and, and make a new file. Uh, it'll be right in here. And we'll call this, um, how do I run tests right now? Oh, I just have a list of them, okay. So we'll call this uh, assignment. Well, actually, you know what? Hold on, I'm starting to doubt myself here. May maybe what we should do is instead of, I'm gonna waffle a little more. Instead of, um, instead of adding a new feature to the parser, I haven't like I I did a little bit of type checking here, but I haven't actually written an interpreter, so it may be no, we'll never get through with that tonight. We should just add another feature to the parser. Ugh, like I don't have an interpreter yet, and so I can test that I can test that the grammar of this test program is correct, but I can't test that it actually does return the value twelve. Um I would have to write the code generation part uh, to do that. I don't think I want to do that tonight. Cause that'll take forever. The stream's already more than half over. So let's just add it. Yeah, let's just add an assignment feature. Assignment syntax. Okay. Um, first of all, why is this called static declare and not static define? Actually, what it should be called is double colon. So I'm gonna call it double colon. I think uh, since this is the parser, the parser like you can use you can use one symbol for multiple different things. Uh, and since this is the lecture, did I say the parser? I meant lecture. Since this is the lecture, it doesn't know if it's a you know what kind of punctuation it is if it's supposed to mean static declaration or something else. So I'm just gonna call it what it is double colon. Um, a variable definition in my language should look something like this. I'm, I'm using kind of the new style of doing things that Swift, Swift and uh, actually that dragon book that I just showed you uses this syntax a lot. And it means that a variable 
a variable um, whose name is A gets created and assigned the value five. Or no, let's do 12. And uh, we'll return A here. And we need a semicolon. So this, this, this is the syntax that we're gonna try and make pass our parser tonight. If we can get this, I think I'll be pretty happy. So this is uh, create a variable A, assign it the value 12, uh, and then return the, the variable A. This should fail. This is gonna fail. Yep. Oh wow, that didn't fail where I thought it would was gonna fail. Interesting. See, this is the problem with JavaScript. Scaling assert is not a function. How did this compile at all? C would have given me a, a much different kind of error. It's scalar.assert. See, how long did this persist in my program? Okay. So there was, a, there was an assert. Um, and console.j, oh, that's the assert. 450, yes, I know that. Oh, because I'm unimplemented, of course. Okay, so it's trying to parse a statement that is not a return statement. Great. Okay. So this is no longer unimplemented, basically. This is the, the thing. So this is an expression of some kind. Um, let's not start at the parser though, you know what? Let's not start at the parser. Let's start at the lecture. We're gonna start, we're gonna go top down here. So looking at my test program, I have to add this symbol, this punctuation symbol right here into my lecture because it's not currently there. Okay, we have a double colon, we have a semicolon, we have an arrow. We don't have a, a colon equal. So I'm just gonna add that right here. Colon equal, equals I plus plus. And we'll organize these a little bit. Then I have to add it over here too, so just after the double colon comes a colon equal. So now, uh, let's see. Now the um, lecture should support my colon equal operator. But this is rather strange because if it didn't recognize that punctuation, it should have given an error. So I'm gonna go and comment this out and make sure it gives an, actually gives an error when you do colon equal, right? It should, that should not have gotten past the parser. Or maybe it didn't, oh yeah, it didn't get to the, it didn't get to the parser because the parser had already thrown an error. Let's see. Yeah, it, it didn't, so it didn't even get that far. Okay. Well, let's do this. I don't want to drop this error on the floor if this is indeed like a, like a problem with my compiler. So let me see. Um, I'm just gonna put like a, um, an intentional, an intentional syntax error right here in the application. And then hopefully that will trigger the problem later. So we can we, we can proceed here at the lecture. Okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna add colon equal operator to our um, program. Good. So we have to update the lecture to handle that, which should be already done because this basic token, get basic token function, scans through this list at, you know, when it, when it reaches this spot in the program, we'll scan through that list and try and match anything in that list and then return the, the corresponding um, token. So, uh, so I think we're good there. I think the, the, the lexer should be up to date now. Hmm. 
Okay. Yep, see, this is wrong. But we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the lecture's up to date. That should be true. Five, six, four, okay. So now we'll finally go back to where we are. Where we're. So the lecture can identify this, you know, this operator right here, which is uh, like an assignment definition and assignment combined operator. Um, so now I'm going to go to my parser and I'm going to create. So now I have to create like a, a, a parsing node that represents the, um, the, you know, the thing, the thing that I'm adding that represents this parse assign. And actually, I think I'm going to make two nodes. I'm going to make a, um, you know what? Let's simplify this. Let's simplify this. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do two different two different features. We're gonna do definition first, and then assignment, and then we'll combine the two later. That's what we're gonna do. So colon, wait, double colon, colon. Actually, this should probably go like this. Colon and uh, oops. Equals. Equals. So we're adding, we're really adding two tokens to our lecture. All right. So we start with single colon, then double colon, then semicolon, then equals, then arrow. You got to keep these two lists in sync, in sync uh, by hand. I haven't figured out a better way of doing that. Okay. So that should be up. That should be it for the for the the lecture is updated. So back down to the parser. All right. So we have to create two new AST node types. Okay. One for um, definition. We're defining a variable, and one for assignment. Okay, and both the definition and the assignment are going to be expressions, expressions. Is that true? Is that true or should the definition be a statement? Can a definition be part of an expression? I don't think so. Oh, you know what else? You know what we didn't do over here? Did we not do this? Is there a precedence? No, I don't have one yet. Okay, I, that's fine. Okay, um, so this is this is an interesting question. When you're when you're parsing, do you let the variable definition be an expression that you can fit into other like, in, in inside of, of other expressions or not? And uh, Like, let's see what Java does. So Java is interesting in that you can find the Java. I've searched for this a lot. This is uh, called the Bacchus Now form. Um, actually, it's not even giving the Bacchus Now form. Well, it probably will if I click one of these. Let's see, statement. Yeah, this is Bacchus Now form. It's just a way of like specifying what a grammar is um, of a language. So you can, you can kind of see it. A statement can either be a variable declaration or an expression or a statement block or an if statement or a DS statement, etc. And it looks like they have a variable declaration as a special kind of statement. So a variable def declaration is a modifier and then a type and then a declarator and then potentially um, a comma and then some more declarators. And then a declarator is just, you know, identifier equals initializer. 
So anyway, they have they have a variable declaration as being like its own its own thing. Uh, it's not just another kind of expression. So an expression, and I think that's probably the correct way to do this. An expression, um, you can't you can't define a variable inside an expression. Or declare. I guess there's no difference between declare and define when you're talking about just a local variable. Yeah, none of these let you declare the variable inside the uh, inside the expression. Yeah, let's look at a few other languages. See how they do it. Uh, well, we know how C does it. I don't think C lets you do that. Let's see if there's a BNF for C. There's now form. I've never searched for this before. I don't know. Oh, wait. Yes, I have. Oh, great. So somewhere around here, there's a statement. Sta statement. And a statement is either a labeled statement. Uh... Really? Oh, for go to's, of course. Exp statement, what is that? Oh, an expression statement, a compound statement. A compound statement, uh, it's just a bunch of statements tacked together, really. Selection statement, selection statement is, you know, it's either an if or a switch. An iteration statement, yeah, or a jump statement. So, but where is, where is the type? Like, where's the, sorry, where's the, um, where's the definition? Oh, here we go. Initializer, assignment expression. So where's this initializer used? It's a knit declarator. Init declarator yeah decal spags okay here we go These grammars can get very complicated in case you didn't notice. So a, so a declaration can be part of a function definition. Um, oh, here, I just have to use this one. Oh, there are a ton of those. Yeah, so here we go. It's decal list. And decal list is that. So here you have like um, a compound statement is, you know, some declarations. So the declarations are separate from, they're not expressions. So that's, that's C. They're not expressions because like you have a statement that has a declaration list inside of it. And it's not like a child of, of expressions in this, in this. I don't know, I, ha I don't have the words to describe what I'm seeing here. Let's look at one other BNF though, that's maybe a little more easy to understand. Um, and we can find it, Lua. Lua has a pretty good BNF. It's simple, it's reductively simple. It's much simpler than C. And you just find it at the very bottom of the Lua documentation. The complete syntax of Lua just almost fits on one page. If I zoom out a little bit, maybe. No, not like that. Uh, and, uh, let's see. So you can define a bunch of variables. Uh, how do you define variable in the way? I think you just say var. Oh, give me a break. Come on. Oh, wait, actually, that told me what I wanted to know. How to define, yeah, so you say ver, 
and then give it a name. Oh no, this is still talking about the syntax. Okay, well anyway. Or do you say local? Oh, you say local, that's what you do. Local. I see, I'm not up on my Lua syntax. Yeah, local. Okay, so here we go. You use the local keyword to define a variable in Lua. So a statement can either be um, a variable list equals an expression list, or it can be a function call, or it can be the do, you know, a do keyword with a block, or a while keyword with an expression and a block. I mean, it can be a bunch of things. Or it can be the keyword local, um, and then a bunch of names, and then a bunch of expressions that they're equal to. So in other words, a variable definition is not an expression in any of these languages. So I think I'm just gonna follow that, and that's probably a good decision that they made, so I think I'm just gonna follow that convention. Um, but an assignment is definitely an expression because it has a value. So, so we made, so let's see, this guy, this definition is not an expression, so I'm gonna get out of here. It's a type of statement, return statement. Let's call it declare. Declare statement. Statement. Okay. So we made a new kind of statement and a new kind of assignment. Uh, and now we're going to come down here and we're going to actually make new classes for these. So we have function definition, statement, block, return statement. And now I'm going to make a uh, declare statement. Declared statement does not have an associated expression. Okay. So you can't get its expression. Declare statements. Okay. Now we're going to take make a type of expression, which is going to be... Oh wait, this is weird. Oh no, it's not, that's fine. Okay, type of expression which will be uh, assignment. Assignment. And then, an expression is of type, uh, an assignment is of type expression. So we're just creating the nodes our tree. All right, an assignment is type expression. Uh, let's see, it's got to have. So an assignment is a is a binary expression, meaning it has a left side and a right side. And there are a lot of binary expressions. In fact, probably most of them are binary. So maybe we should make this um, more general and we should just say binary expression. I think that's what we should do. And then we can have, so let's make this guy binary expression. Okay. Binary expression. It's the object type. Good. So now we'll just have we'll have we'll have three um, fields in this binary expression. We'll have left, ugh, left, which is of type another expression. So yeah, I use these comments to help me keep track of what types things are because JavaScript, you know, doesn't have any types. So a left and a right type. I'm sorry, a left and a right expression, and. Uh, an operator and the operator is just going to be a token so let's see where's my token where's my token type this guy so a binary expression in our abstract syntax tree has a left expression and a right expression 
and an operator to relate them. I think that be, that would be good. So see, see, this way, I don't have to have an addition expression, a multiplication expression, a division expression, an assignment expression, a uh, dot expression, where I say a dot b. These are all just binary expressions. All right, I like that. We'll go with that. So now we have to. Um, so now we have to figure out what kind of statement this is. So notice we've, we've created two kinds of statement now because this variable declaration is not a statement. I'm sorry, it's not an expression. It's a statement. Um, but it's not, so this, this statement is just an expression. It's just one binary expression, which is an assignment. But this statement is a special kind of statement. It's an assignment statement. So this is, you know, this is funky. Um, but they both begin with an A. So they, they both can begin with an identifier. So this is going to be weird. So what, so what I have to do, so remember, the problem here is that I can only look at the very next token in the stream. I can't look ahead more than one token um, because this is a one look ahead recursive descent parser. Right. By limiting myself to only one look ahead, uh, I make myself, I make my job a lot easier. I could do more look aheads or I could do like look behinds and stuff like that. But if I just limit myself to one look ahead, then things are really simple. It's called a context free grammar, right? The only thing that the parser knows is what is the next symbol. And what we're, you know, it also has the, it also has the information about all the previous symbols that get you to this function right here but all it considers when it's taking its next step is what is the very next symbol so both of these start with the same symbol they start with an identifier they start with the same token and I can only look one token ahead um, so what I'm gonna do here okay so I'm gonna I'm gonna eat this first token this dot eat uh, lex dot tokens dot identifier okay I'm gonna eat an identifier token that'll be this token right here the identifier that comes at the beginning but then after that I'm gonna do a switch on what comes next okay so if this dot peak wait this dot lexer dot peak dot type is lex.tokens. Um, colon. Now I have a uh, I have a variable variable dec or declaration. Okay. Otherwise, I have an expression. Okay. So. Let's start with the variable declaration. Let's put this assert back. Uh, where'd my assert go? I deleted it. I'm just gonna copy an existing assert instead of trying to write assert again because I know I'm gonna write it wrong and write scaling instead of scalar. Scalar.assert. So the expression we're gonna leave unimplemented for now. In fact, I'm even gonna take it out of here. Okay. We're going to focus on the declaration. This dot eat lex dot tokens dot colon. We're going to eat that colon. Eat this colon right here. And then we should have somewhere around here um, a function to parse a type. Here it is. Parse type. Okay. This dot parse type. All right. So in most languages, you'll be able to write something like this, like a colon int equals something, but we're gonna leave this alone for now. We're just gonna say this dot parse type, 
And then that's it. That's all this def de declaration statement is allowed to have. But down here, we can do a little better. We can say this dot eat whatever there is. Uh, this get the lecture dot peak dot that type. Whatever's there, it it sh well, hold on. We should make sure that it's an operator though. How do we do that? Wait, no, we can't do this here. What am I doing? What am I doing? We have to do operator precedence here. So I'm going to leave this for now. I'm going to leave that right there. Okay. So we'll probably still hit this assert. Um, no, we shouldn't hit the assert. We shouldn't hit this assert because I took the um, this, this assignment statement out. Okay, but we still hit, oh no, we still do hit this assert. Oh, did I not save this? No, I did. Oh, we're still sitting hitting this assert somehow, that's no good. So I, it should recognize that this is a uh, variable declaration. And so it does the variable de declaration here. Um, oh, I forgot the semicolon, so it should parse the type and then it should eat a semicolon. But that still doesn't matter. So 492, we're still hitting this assert. Why would we be hitting that assert? Let's go to the debugger. We can close this and this and this and this and this. Due to the debugger. Reload the debugger. So I'm going to set a breakpoint over here. Parse statement. Oh, hold on. Parse statement. You have to tell the debugger to re... Ugh, oh, this stupid thing. You have to tell it to refresh the page every time you want to debug, which it, if you're in the debugger mode, it should just always refresh all your resources anyway. I don't know why it wouldn't. Um, maybe people have like crazy pages with lots of resources and they don't want to read, but it's like, it's local. There should, it shouldn't be hitting the cache for something that's local. I don't get it anyway. I have to do command option E before I command R to reload the page. And then when I command R, it, like, I can't finger scroll anymore for some reason. I'm just, I'm not happy. See, no finger scrolling anymore. I don't like it. Got to use this stupid thing. Okay, so I'm going to put this here. And then command R again. All right, and we'll step through this. So let's look at where our lecture is now. Um, okay, we're back. We can scroll again. So let's see here. Next token is the identifier A. Good. Okay, let's step through that. We're going to eat that identifier. All right, here's a simple helper function. Uh, the, it saves the old token and then tells the lecture to eat the, uh, let's see, what is expected? Two, great. It was the correct type, it was an identifier. So it will lex the next token So let's absorb all the white space, of which there's one space. 
and it'll make a new token. It's not the end of the file. Uh, it should be a basic token, so it grabs that basic token. And it's one character long, so it will build a string with that basic token in it, which it has now done. So this, then I go down to next, and then it should be this colon character, great. So that colon character corresponds to that colon character right there that it's currently lexing. And it's gonna return that, that colon character, as a basic token in our program. So good. Uh, good, 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 returning it. So it is a colon, so we get over here. Okay, so it did, it did the right thing. It went into the variable declaration. Okay, and then it eats a colon, it eats that colon, and then it parses a type, and then it eats a semicolon. So that's good. All of that works fine. And there's another statement after that, which should be the return statement. You see it starts with the return, and then that's good, and then, okay. Oh, uh, maybe. Maybe it's the other test that's failing? There are no statements in the other test. I don't get it. Okay, let's continue. So the next time it hits this, what is it parsing? Same as before, it's got this So what, hold on, what I don't understand now is that it hit this twice. It shouldn't have hit it twice. It should be compiling each test once. Something's weird here. Yeah, and the second time, it gets something other than a semicolon, which is what it should have gotten. Let's see what the lecture thinks it is. Next character is it or something other than a colon, it got a semicolon. Character end 11, character start 10. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Ah, that's what's going on. Okay, so I think when it goes to parse the return statement, no, it's just parsing the regular statement. It's 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 trying to it's trying to parse this curly or this sorry this this semicolon right here, and it thinks that it's um, an expression. It thinks that it's thinks it should be going in here for this expression. When it shouldn't. All right, let's start again here. All right, we know what it's doing right here. It's parsing the declaration statement. That. Good, so far so good. Now it goes to parse the next statement. Should realize it's a return statement, which it does. And then it goes to parse an expression. Oh, see the expression. Okay, my expression um, parsing function is very simple and it thinks that the only thing that exists ever is a numeric literal. But that's wrong. It's not a numeric literal, so it returns false. All right. So we add an error, because A is not a numeric literal. We return that expression. But then we just go on and continue parsing, but pretty much ignore all the rest of the errors. Um, but it should find a semicolon like it wants. Because there is a semicolon after the A, actually. There it is. Okay. 
Um, let's see what the lecture thinks it has now. It thinks it has an A. Oh, because it never actually parsed the A because it was looking for a numeric literal. Okay, we'll just put a numeric literal there and then this won't be a problem. Fine. So now we have a problem somewhere else. Line 802, unrecognized statement type. Oh, very good. So this is our static checker seeing, oh, I don't recognize this statement type. So this is pretty easy to resolve. Uh, we're just gonna add a new statement type. If the object is of type uh, declare, declare statement, then uh, let's see. We'll have to write this code later. So what is it doing? Resolve the type of the expression, statement get expression. Uh, and set the expression in the in the prototype map. Let's see. Statement get expression. Yeah, the return statement has an expression, but not all statements necessarily have an expression. Is that true? Can a statement have can a statement not have an expression? Let's see. Let's look at the new uh, Lua BNF again. Come on, all the way to the bottom. Load the page, load the page, come on. All the way to the bottom. And these are all the different types of statements. Uh, do, yep, this one doesn't have an express, expression. Uh, but this one does. Repeat, see, we might not have, we might not have this uh, construct in our language. This one has a bunch of expressions. It's a for loop, of course. For, yeah, so we definitely don't want to have like this limitation that every statement has exactly one expression in it. Because a for loop has like three exp expressions in it. You got to do four and then the initializer and then the condition and then the you know, the loop behavior, I++ plus plus or whatever. And a lot of these don't have any expressions. Okay. So thanks, Lua. Oh, I'm going to leave that open. So our declare statement is not gonna have an expression. Okay, so that's fine. So no expression here. So I, we might actually do nothing. Yeah, I think we do nothing for now. Do nothing until we support uh, an initializer. Good. So now, wow, still an error. It doesn't recognize the type. Uh, let's see here. So this function, this statement, oh, it's null. Of course it doesn't recognize a null statement. Okay, and it's a null statement because in our parsing function, parse statement, we return a null statement. So let's fix that. Return. Mm, let's do it this way. Let uh, declare statement equals new nodes dot declare statement. 
So we're not actually going to populate that declare statement yet because we're just trying to um, get our part uh, working at the parsing level, which we did. Good. All tests pass now. Okay. So this works. So far, so good. So this doesn't actually create a variable in our program yet because um, we're just validating the parsing. At this is just the parsing at this stage. We just like, we're just seeing if the program has the grammar that we expect, right? We're not actually um, doing anything with that grammar yet. We're not like doing anything with the, with the, with the variable and with the type here. We're just seeing it like if it passes the grammar that we expect. Uh, so let's, so we have that done. Let's do the expression now. A equals 12. So if we do this, then we have to do operator precedence. I think that's true. Let's not do it this way then. I don't want to do operator precedence. Let's do it this way. Okay. So now we say if we peek at the next token. Okay. So we've gotten this far. We've seen that. Oh, not that far. Okay. We ate a colon. Here's the colon. And then we ate a type. Here's the type. Okay. So then we look at the next guy. If it's an equals, then there's an initializer coming after this. Okay. So then we have to parse an expression containing that whatever, whatever is after the equals. So we're going to do this dot parse expression. Uh, and I have to go to this declare statement now and say object dot underscore expression equals an object. And that object will be one of these. So you can declare a variable and optionally give it um, an expression to initialize it. That's what this is saying. And so let's come over here, declare a statement. So we're going to say our declare statement dot uh, expression is null if uh, if there's no equals. So if there's if there's no assignment, then our the expression in this in this node is just going to be null. There's going to be nothing there. Otherwise, we will set it to the result of the expression. Yep. That should do it. But then after that expression is done, we're done. We got to have a semicolon at that point. There's got to be a semicolon at the end of every line. This is not JavaScript. Thank you very much. Okay. So that's pretty, that's pretty good right there. Um, currently the expression only supports a numeric literal, but that's fine. We have a numeric literal, literal right there. So now we come down here and we, we can actually do something now in our, in our type checking. We can say let type equal static. So we're going to resolve the type of the expression of this statement. Statement dot get expression. And we should probably implement this get expression routine. So get expression is just, um, I mean, it does what it sounds like. It gets the expression. <laughs> it's a getter for the expression. Okay. Uh, and then we're gonna, in, so we have a map of all of the object, all of the, yeah, all of the nodes in our abstract syntax tree. And uh, 
we're going to map all of those nodes to the type. So we're building a list of, as we go through our program, we're building a list of this thing is of type this, and that thing is of type that. Okay. So here we resolve the type of the expression. In this case, the expression is 12. So if you go to resolve type of expression, it should just be like, yeah, currently all of our, all of our um, expressions of our, are just integers. Okay. But in the future, this will resolve the type and I'll do that recursively. So like, so like this expression, a function that calls a string. The value, the, the value of the, the, the type of this expression is the return type of the function, right? The type of this is string. If I try and do this, so let's, let's say f, let's say f is a function that returns a string and I try and do this, then the evaluator will go in here. It's trying to evaluate the type of the expression. So this is this is an adding expression it adds two sub expressions together and so it'll evaluate the left side and then it'll evaluate the right side and then when it evaluates the right side it sees it's just a regular boring old numeric like an integer and when it evaluates the left side it sees that uh, it's a function and so whatever the return value of the function is that's the return value of our type okay so then it sees it has that return value on the left, and that better be something that's implicitly convertible to the type on the right. And so that's what our type chunk, like it's a kind of a recursive procedure that, you know, for each node in the AST, it goes down to its child nodes and say, well, okay, what types are you? And then it matches the types, and if there's no error, then it's good, and it returns the, the, the result type. That's the idea of what this function is supposed to do, result, resolve type of expression, but I haven't implemented yet. So right now all expressions are integers, which is fine. So we resolve that expression. We set it to this variable and then we set that in the type map. So that should be good. But it's not, man, I feel like really eating my words tonight here. Really? This assert again? How could it be hitting this? It's probably another error in parsing. That's probably what it is. You know what, I should put a break point in the part of the lecture where it gives an, oh my God, stupid. In the part of the lecture where it gives a, um, where I go to, to do it, don't. Um, that is really frustrating. Why is it doing that? So, here. If the expected value of the lecture is ever not equal to the, um, to the type that we passed in, to, to the to the type that's coming up next in the in the in the token stream should probably know about that sooner so we're going to put a breakpoint right here and make sure that's not the problem of course it is the problem so which statement so let's see what's going on here we're trying to parse an expression which we expect to be a numeric literal uh, what is it actually? It's an equals. Oh, and then of course, because, uh, okay. We didn't actually eat the equals here. Let's do that. We have to consume the equals to get it off the stream. And then following the equals should be, yeah, so there we go. Should be the expression. All right, that's cool. That works pretty well.
That worked pretty well. So we have our, um, we have our, uh, you know, declaration and assignment. Um, and yeah, stream officially over and uh, a little bit slow tonight too. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it a night here. I'm not sure if it's election night and so everybody's watching the results of the election. I mean, obviously Hillary's gonna win. I don't know why people care so much. But, uh, or maybe um, compilers aren't that interesting. I don't know. I think they're interesting. Maybe, uh, maybe Twitch doesn't agree with me as much. And either way, I'm getting tired as well. So I'm going to call it a night right here. Uh, we'll see if we do compilers more next week, or we might go back to renders. Or let's see. Actually, we started with the reflection system, but... Um, I've moved past that now, and I'm building a renderer. And renderer might be actually more fun, because it's actually kind of a video game, and people like to see watch people making video games. So I might go back to the renderer for next week. Do that instead. So we'll see. Uh, thank you, everybody, who joined in. Uh, I had a lot of fun, and I will see you next time.